Good morning. Now before you click away from the video, give me a minute. So as many of you know, I live here in Carmel, Indiana. I've lived here for two years now. And a lot of these infrastructure rides, of course, take place here, right? But the purpose of these videos is not to show off Carmel, Indiana or make it about Carmel, Indiana. My infrastructure observations are always meant to be, shall I say, neutral. As in the context of what we see with the infrastructure can be applied to almost any city, especially in North America. So we're gonna go for a ride today and take a look at some things. And we're gonna point out the good and the bad. And again, it's not about the city that I'm in right now. You can apply these observations and these lessons to where you're from um, and the infrastructure that you have in the area, which might be similar, which is deserved of certain critiques or praises, or it might be different and maybe you like something that you see here that you want implemented where you live. Um, or you see something here that you know you don't want coming to a, a street near you. Um, and everybody that seems to make content about Carmel, Indiana loves to write puff pieces and focus on the shiny spots, i.e. the roundabouts or especially the Monon, which we just got on right now and turn it around. I'm gonna let you face forward a little bit. So we're on the Monon. This is where the bulk of the traffic happens. This is where everybody's on a bike. This is where everybody's walking because this is where there's no cars, right? But what is my city and what is your city doing about the infrastructure that's not their shiny spots, that's not the subject of their puff pieces, uh, for lack of a better term? Well, so that's what we're gonna do today. We're gonna take a route that I take to go to a chiropractor appointment, which is well off the Monon and just features your, every, uh, your everyday infrastructure. And we're gonna talk about that, what they're doing good and what they're doing bad, what they could improve upon and uh, what they should do more of. I think somebody just said good morning to me and I completely missed it, I'm sorry. So, let's face forward while we get off of the Monon and get onto the real infrastructure. So we just went under a road, I think it's called City Center Drive. And we're gonna be heading uh, west. Now you're gonna notice up here, this is a heck of a tight curve. So this is kind of bad design. Someone on a bike can't just really, yeah, they can't do this curve. Now let's back up and talk about that. They need to make, they need to make this so somebody can get through it without getting off their bike, right? Because again, it's not about me. It's about other people with other mobility needs. Um, so what we could have done here is extend uh, the earth here and make something that kind of curves out and allows you to do a bit of a, a circle and then get going back that way. Also, you'll notice that immediately we're put onto a curved back sidewalk and curved back means it's just, um, it goes street, curb, sidewalk there's no there's no forgiveness <laughs> there's no leeway uh, so this is what you call a curved back sidewalk this is definitely not a multi-use path it's just a sidewalk but uh, my city counts this as part of their bike infrastructure network and i don't think that's right i don't think they should be allowed to do that um, but obviously the people that count this as bike infrastructure never get out of their cars or never leave the Monon for their recreational riding. 
Uh, a lot of today's video will be face forward because we're talking about infrastructure and evaluating it. Um, you might be wondering why are curbed back uh, sidewalks bad design? Well, that's because there's no margin for error. Um, anybody on a bike or anybody walking or anybody with mobility needs, and by the way, look at this sharp corner. <laughs> um, there's no room for error. So if they tripped while walking or uh, lost balance on their bike, there's, if they fall that way, for example, because that's where the road is, they fall right in the road, right into car traffic, right? And that puts their life at risk. Um, now, right now, you'll see that there's a little bit of green separation, and that's better. Uh, but also, it would be better if it was wider. But at least now, there is some margin for error. Um, focusing back forward on the infrastructure we're on now, so again, this is just a sidewalk, okay? Um, but many cities in North America count this as bike infrastructure. So what happens when you meet someone walking their dog or someone walking or another person on a bike or somebody in a wheelchair or somebody in a mobility scooter or somebody on a regular scooter, whatever. We're all forced over to share this tiny sliver of infrastructure and that's not right especially when you look over and you see four lanes for motorists. We've got one, two, a divide, and then three, four. Yes, there is a path on the other side that is leaning more towards multi-use path width, but why isn't it both sides, right? Why are we over here on a curbed back sidewalk when motorists get four lanes. And before any of the motorists start yelling, oh, but I pay gas taxes and all that BS. Gas taxes don't pay for all this. It, like, like that much. And, and look at how much the gas tax has come up in recent decades. Next to nothing, we're all subsidizing your driving. And hey, I drive too, I have a car but I live locally and I make an effort to try to live like this and it saves me a ton of money. I don't want to identify as a cyclist. <laughs> I'm not a cyclist. Uh, I just have an electric cargo bike that does the work of a car, right? Okay. So let's stop here. My squeaky brakes. So not only do we have these bad curbed back sidewalks, right? With all this traffic coming past. But then, as usual, at our conflict points, we have the car infrastructure taking the top layer, right? And so what that does to motorists whenever they have the top layer, and by top layer, layer I mean the road runs over what should be the bike path or the pedestrian path. Um, by having the motorist infrastructure as the top layer, it encourages inattentiveness, uh, a sense of entitlement and priority, and like the motorist gets first place here, they belong here, nobody else could be coming through here. Uh, and that's one thing that you're going to see in the Netherlands or some other countries that are doing things better, and even some North American cities, is continuous sidewalks. So that means there's no grade change. For us, imagine this is a multi-use path and not this garbage curbed back sidewalk, right? Well, if it was a continuous sidewalk, it would continue on at the same level we are here and it would go over the car infrastructure, right? And so the cars would have to come up and they would see color differentiation or pavement differentiation and they would have to come up and over our infrastructure which would command alertness, um, calming, right? Uh, but we still don't grasp that concept here in North America. Uh, and we need to, to, especially in our urban settings, to, 
to uh, direct motorist behavior, right? And you have to do that through design elements. You can't do that through signs. You can't put a sign up that says pedestrian crossing. No. You have to put in design elements, often via the pavement or squeezing the lane, um, that demands compliance, doesn't request it. it it makes them pay attention, it makes them slow down, it doesn't request it. If, if we all rely upon um, motorist compliance to keep us safe, well, we're, gonna, I, we're all gonna wind up injured, dead, and disappointed. And you know that, when you get behind the wheel of a car, just by the state of the design, you find yourself uh, being more reckless or inattentive, not because that's your objective, but the infrastructure encourages that through its design. Okay, so we're going to be getting off City Center Drive. We're going to cross this roundabout. And let's take a look at the design of the crossing. So it's set back a bit, right? but it's still a pretty sharp corner. So another theme that you're gonna notice in the infrastructure design in this city and in other cities across North America is that we have all these smooth angles, right? For motorists, smooth angles to help encourage speed to aid in level of service for cars and motorists. But when it comes to uh, active infrastructure where people are walking, people are cycling, we have all these sharp curves, which are hard to navigate, which means people have to slow a lot or completely stop and get off. Um, and yeah, that doesn't make for very fluid, efficient uh, bike infrastructure. Hold on, have to check something on my microphone. Okay, we're good. <laughs> We don't have polished content on the American Feature YouTube channel, so I'm going to keep the camera forward while we go through here. We're going to be going through the crossing and take a right. All right. So now I have to turn my neck all the way back to try to see if cars are coming, which is another bad design flaw, right? A lot of people can't do that. And now we're back onto a multi-use path. This is a multi-use path. This is probably, I wouldn't say it's two meters. Maybe it's close, two meters wide. Now this is a good design. This is well separated, right? So if I fall off my bike here, <laughs> or somebody falls over walking, they're gonna fall into the grass, not the street. And this type of design makes it so people of all ages and abilities can ride or walk safely and they're encouraged to do so because they don't feel threatened by cars. I mean, that truck doesn't bother me. I got the green separation. I've got trees between me and him and I'm sure it's a him. <laughs> um, so yeah, this is great design. Do this. North American cities can implement multi-use paths. Um, I think is a great first step solution as opposed to trying to go full Netherlands, which isn't, you know, it's not a rational approach to it, at least where we are, because we're more than 50 years behind. Um, I did stop here because we got a crossing. Again, this should be a raised crossing to demand that motorists slow down um, and to just calm the entire street, right? So, yeah, those people are coming through at a decent speed, but that doesn't mean they all do, right? So anyway, if you want to save lives and encourage more people to be able to get out of a car and get around their city, things like this should be raised, and then also design elements introduced via bollards or green greenery to somewhat shrink that raised crossing because that also slows traffic. Like that truck just blasted through this, right? Because of the design, not necessarily because the motorist is a, a jerk, right? Most people that you think are just psychopaths and idiots behind the wheel of a car, 
they're, they're, they appear that way because of design, not necessarily because of the type of person they are. You can't, you can't cast these assumptions upon the person all time, at all times. It's hostile design and it encourages hostile behavior, intended or not, right? So let's keep going. Here's another crossing again. These types of things should just be raised by standard in urban areas. I wish we had national standards, but we have this massive country with 50 states and people arguing over state rights, city rights, regional rights, federal rights, and we're never going to be able to agree upon anything. Now you'll see by having that nice multi-use path, me and that person walking, no conflicts at all, right? We passed each other perfectly. So, right here, this bend is really nice, okay? Rather than, rather than keeping that crossing up there where it could be more conflicting by having it back here, maybe I just, uh, let me park the bike. All right, so check that out. They shouldn't be parked right there. They should actually come up a little bit more and get out of this crossing, right? <laughs> but it would probably help if this crossing was raised so they would know to stop there, come up and over, and then wait here for their chance to pull out. And that's another thing about this design that's really good. Good job, Car good job Carmel. <laughs> and good job to anybody else who would do it. Um, set the crossing back, not up against that road, right? And then that allows them to try to keep this clear with queuing motorists stopping back here, and then the next one or two cars stopping up here to go out while we try to keep this crossing clear. Let's see how it works here while I get on the bike. So he approached slowly, he went through, still hung his rear end out, but it could be worse. So let's keep going. We're about halfway there and it's only going to get better, I promise. And by better, I mean worse. Okay, again, we need softer corners uh, so people don't have to jerk it like that 90 degrees. Okay. Now here we are, another multi-use path with some decent separation. Not perfect, I'd like to see it a little bit further, but decent. Over on our right, we've got a school. So good to see this infrastructure budding up against the school. Um, the road for cars, we've got 30 mile an hour speed limits. We've got a road diet, but those lanes are super wide. And super wide lanes, encourage speed. So those lanes should be narrowed more. When you narrow the field of vision, people pay attention more, people slow down. Um, we can't have these big wide lanes. And besides, the bigger, the wider the lane, the more money it costs to, first of all, put it in, the more money it costs to maintain for all of us, all taxpayers. So smaller, narrow, narrower, higher quality, right? Over here we got a community garden. That's pretty cool. Back behind the school. Now let's look at the path we're on now. Good thing I got long arms because it's hard to reach the handle. Again, nice separation. We got some green cover here between the trees on our right, trees on our left. These do pay off whenever it's sunny outside. Um, and hot. But yeah, this, this is comfortable, this is good. Now it's not mirrored on the other side, we just got a sidewalk over there. When possible, especially in these urban areas where people live and go places, we need to have this type of stuff on both sides. Okay, let's stop and talk about this. 
hope I don't block anybody. So what's wrong with this? I'll tell you. So we've got this, these trees here, which I don't want to get rid of necessarily. But then we've got this obstruction here creating a blind spot. So people coming out, motors coming out, aren't going to slow down much to take the time to look and see if there's a bike coming or something. They're just going to barrel into the crossing, especially because once again, the motorist infrastructure takes the top layer and they think we belong here. Those white lines, eh, they're just a eh, afterthought, right? So again, this should be a raised crosswalk. Um, with some other des design elements into it that say, hey, people cross through here, you need to stop, look, and then maybe increase, maybe set this back, right? So, so the path crosses it further back, you know how we talked about that earlier, they can come up and over one car, and then that one car can sit over here and wait their turn to go without blocking the path. These are just, I know it seems like, Oh boy, you're adding up the cost here on how much it costs to do infrastructure. It doesn't really add much extra cost. It just means using proper design and doing it right the first time or retrofitting it and doing it right. And you don't have to do it again. You save lives and you encourage more people in your city to try to get around outside of a, a car, right? And that's good. That's financially sustainable. That's good for mental health, physical health of the people who live in your city. Um, yeah, there's, there's just a domino effect of benefits. Now things are gonna start to get pretty hairy. <laughs> we're gonna have a lot to talk about, but we're almost finished with this one-way ride. I could ride back home another way and talk about a whole bunch more, but trying to keep this short, uh, short and full of good information right and not make it too long and once you get too long yeah, you want to do something else right you got to go to the bathroom you want to watch a different video you gotta uh, blah, blah 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 anyway turn that it's going to be a lot of forward facing camera rather than facing me again we've got a lot to look at here we go we're almost there i think we're like less than a kilometer away from the end but a lot to look at so here's a place that I've reported to the city uh, many times. Nothing's been done about it and likely nothing will ever be done about it. When you're coming from that direction, the multi-use path brings you this way and as you approach these steps here, you see the steps? You don't see them, like this, the illusion as you're coming this way towards where we are now, it looks like it's just the continuous path until the last second you see these steps. Somebody's gonna get hurt here. I've reported this. They've acknowledged getting the report at Carmel and they do nothing about it. That's so typical. <laughs> so typical of not just Carmel, but you know, North American cities in general. So it's not just one pointing finger here. So we're gonna cross here. Now look at this crossing. Basically, it just means people have to stop on a bike and look. The, the, let's stop, I'm just gonna stop and get off. The white lines are faded and gone, which means that this whole pedestrians and bikes getting around is an afterthought, right? Otherwise the city would do something about this. Again, this should be raised, that should be raised to make motorists stop, slow down, stop here, come over it, advance next, wait their turn to enter the roundabout. Um, so this is, this is poor design that, that could be easily fixed, but it's not, right? So we're gonna go through here. Nope, go ahead, go ahead lady. Thank you anyway. That was very kind of her. She stopped and she's like, are you crossing? No. Okay. Oh, and also this little island in the middle. This is where I came up. No, this isn't it. I've, I've seen people stranded here so many times, just standing in the island, waiting for a deer motorist to let them cross. And 
you all know that story and how that goes. So yeah, tiny little pedestrian island here. This, this guy, yeah, not stopping for me like a jerk off. And then a tight turn. So you notice that that guy did not stop for me. And uh, by law, he didn't have to actually because I was still in the I was still on the island there, right? Had I had one wheel out into the, into the crossing, he would have been legally obligated to stop and yield to me, but he wouldn't have. Um, and had he done it, probably some distracted driver going way too fast and aggressive would have come through and rear-ended him. <laughs> it's just this whole thing of our bad laws, bad infrastructure design, that encourages vehicular violence and and um, an attitude towards people outside of cars just simply trying to get around. Uh, we can take a look at the roundabout, maybe. It's not a very nice roundabout. I don't, I don't care for it. Uh, because once again, it's technically a double lane roundabout. Carmel traffic engineers are in love with double lane roundabouts and I think they're incompetent fools for doing it all the time and if you're the Carmel traffic engineer and you don't like me saying that I really don't give a damn um, roundabouts that are single lane can serve an incredible amount of vehicles um, my mind is slipping at the moment and I'm gonna give a huge range here just because um, Got some cobwebs up here, I'm forgetting. I think single lane roundabouts can serve somewhere between 36 and 52,000 cars a day. But you can't quote me on that because I forget the right number. Regardless, I mean, come on. This is residential. We got people living back here. Over there, way yonder, we've got nothing but apartments and condos, right? Um, if you look back over here, it's a coffee and pastry shop. Why do we need a double lane roundabout to increase level of service and speed for motorists in a place where people are living and need to get around by bike and foot? And I mean, nobody should have to drive from over there to the coffee and pastry shop. And nobody should have to scurry across one of these crossings like a scared animal. So, you know, this design right here is incomp incompetent and um, it has no place in an urban setting. Um, the city is 100,000 people-ish. Uh, we should have much better design. So, Carmel, you need to do better. And any town USA, you need to do better as well. Continuing on, geez, we're at like almost 30 minutes of this video. Sorry, everybody, but if you stuck around this long, thank you. So to see the multi-use path keeps going, but then it gets stupid. <laughs> Instead of just continuing on here and say, removing parking, because why do we need street parking all over the place? It goes over here, right up against this building. And you can tell how they just ran it up over here. This whole situation was an afterthought, right? They put in that sidewalk probably when they built the building and then eventually they were like, oh, we need to connect our, our, our foot and bike network. So let's just asphalt in some lines. And that's what they did here rather than doing it right. Um, clearly they're doing a road diet here. So why not do everything right, right? They need to shrink that down to one lane each side, get rid of the parking, or just leave a couple parking spots for handicap and loading and unloading zones. But uh, again, at least in regards to my city and what they say they are, they say they're a city for people, not cars, but their design would say otherwise. Okay, so let's, let's show you why this is bad. So we come over here. <laughs> And now up here on the corner on the left is an entrance and exit for people to go into this business. So now we've got a blind spot. 
a bike comes cruising past here, somebody walks out, boom, conflict. And then what happens? <laughs> Takes off like wildfire. Uh, cyclist hits pedestrian. <laughs> Look at the design, right? We, we, ignore, we ignore all this excess. We force people into the margins and then we create sensationalist headlines whenever something bad comes out of the conflict point, the conflict area of the margin. Okay. Again, more bad design here. Can't, can't go very far without something new. So entrance and exit to residential. We've got some mixed use out here, over here. It looks like we've got a place to get your hair cut. There's coffee shops, restaurants. Um, but this crossing is wide. It's also got the slip lane-ish um, ins and outs, right? Why don't they have 90 degree corners where the motorist has to slow way down, turn with attention and come in or out? No, they get these wide radius uh, uh, entrances and exits so they can go with speed and inattentiveness right and then us instead of being able to go straight here we've got to go over here go down out into the wide part of the road and then it's the same thing on the other side so let's go ahead and cross all right we made it across Now let's stop here. Look at all this. Mixed use development, that's awesome. We always need more of that. Uh, we got a lot of outdoor seating and then the sidewalk starts shrinking, right? Four lanes for cars out there, an entire lane for parking here, right? When there's parking lot, there's a surface lot back behind here. None of this is marked handicap. None of this is marked loading, unloading. Nah, it's just free for motorists. And now we're shrunk down to this with the dining that starts to creep out. The dining that starts to creep out and then people walking and people cycling start to get um, crammed together and creating conflict zones. Now let's just go up another more pedal, a few more pedal revolutions. <laughs> and what do you see here? Who in the hell said, hey, let's jam this bike parking right here? So we got the outdoor dining up here this little sliver for people on bikes and foot to operate in and then somebody said hey let's put bike parking here you want to see what it looks like behind me it looks even worse <laughs> who thought this was a good idea now imagine you put a bike here right some lady rides here on a turn gsd a long tail cargo bike with her kids parks that bike here, it takes up this much room. How is anybody supposed to walk through here, wheelchair, mobility scooter, or another bike? I mean, to say, hey, park on this side, well, that's just a stupid argument anyway. Imagine all of these are used. Where'd, where'd the path go, right? Meanwhile, free parking, free parking. This is, it's, it's incompetent. It's unprofessional. It's professionally bankrupt. That's what it is. <sighs> We're almost done. A few more blocks. Okay, again, we're squeezed in here right next to the pub where people are walking in and out of. Bad design here. 
So because somebody on a bike has to go over here, we got a trash can right there, making that even more cramped. You gotta go down. Again, going towards the street, right? So that you can come up on the corner. So there's all that unused street parking, right? Get rid of it. And then again with the bike, uh, the bike racks eating up the sidewalk, which you know if these were full up and let's say some motorist parked here, they'd get out and they'd be like, geez, look at all these bikes clogging up the sidewalk. You know that's how the narrative would go. So this whole place just says a lot without me need, needing to say any more, especially as we go ride up through here. And you see that sign by Athletico Physical Therapy? They had, they had kept pushing it out so that it was blocking the only path through here. And every day I was stopping and pushing it that way over towards their place. And they finally learned <laughs> that they shouldn't push it out further because I was pushing it back and screwing it up. So it looks like they've been keeping it back. So good job. Thanks everybody. Now look at this, look at this right here. That is the dumbest placement for bike parking. Again, a bad crossing as usual. You see all these deviations? I'm gonna stop and get off the bike again. You notice a, a recurring theme like with, with bike and pedestrian infrastructure. It's always going this way and this way and this way and this way, which I guess acts as a form of traffic calming, right? And takes away the efficiency of riding a bike, but you never see that for car infrastructure. Car infrastructure is always nice and straight and efficient and encourages speed and then we're surprised when everybody drives, drives a car. Maybe if we start designing roads to have all the jagged turns left to right, 90 degrees this way, 90 degrees this way, we'd have fewer deaths on our roads because people would be going slower, right? There's Carmel Police. I recently had a not so good encounter with one of their officers off duty, but I won't go into that. <laughs> I'll just leave it at that. So we're about to the chiropractor. It's on the other side. Uh, we're not going to go to the chiropractor. We're just going to kind of stop at it, but we got one more road to cross and it's another bad crossing. Uh, again, it should be a raised crossing because um, I the other day, I'll just stop here so I don't ink make the motorists think I'm about ready to cross. Not that they would notice me. So again, you're going to notice it's a small little sliver that forces this tight turn for somebody on a bike, which means you have to turn your head tightly, which doesn't work for everybody, right? My wife can't do that. She can't go like that because she's not confident enough on a bike to keep her to keep her stability. So she needs more rounded curves to be able to see. But most of the infrastructure forces people to go like that. It's not good for elderly either, right? Now look at that, that's not bad. Almost 80% of that truck was able to pull up. Still blocked the crossing. But he was able to get most of that vehicle out of it. So what do I think about that? I don't know. I'm conflicted, but I'm erring more on the good side of it than the bad. I mean, there's a lot of room there. Anyway, why did I stop here? Oh yeah. So if you can see back here, that tiny little island in the middle, that pedestrian crossing island, I was leaving the chiropractor the other day, which is right over there, coming this way, and I saw two teenage girls standing there. Uh, they had like, one of them had a big cello case, massive. I think they were, I don't know, doing kid stuff, had been at music lessons or going to school, I don't know. And they were both stuck in that island. 
right? <laughs> From the time I was coming out of the chiropractor, I saw them stuck in the island, and it took maybe a minute for me to get there because this roundabout here just had motorist after motorist after motorist coming through it, seeing the girls, and they didn't care. They weren't stopping. Um, so by the time I got here, I just took the cargo bike, <laughs> signaled that I was coming out, came out, stopped right in the middle of the road, which made people there stop. Oh, we got, oh, oh man, I wish you could see this. And anyway, I, I helped the girls to cross. Looks like rather than take the wonky design that we have for the sidewalk and the bike path here, that mom just said, you know what? I'm just gonna go out into one of these lanes, which means that she has to um, risk her life and the life of her child just to keep some efficiency about their route. Uh, and maybe, maybe, maybe it's just difficult for her to navigate this with that bike. Right? So we need better infrastructure design that's easier uh, and more intuitive for all ages and abilities, not just Brandon on a bike who can handle most of this, but is just annoyed, right? So let's cross and let's see if people stop for me. Oh, well, yeah, we might have to. They're gonna stop. Again, I got a really tight corner here. Not good for everybody. So, bad design. How long is it gonna take for her to be able to cross? Let's see if anybody coming up here stops for her or if she has to just stand there and wait. And that motorist isn't gonna wait. That one's not gonna wait. Or, eh, yeah, all right, nope, nope. Just stuck there. If this was a raised crosswalk, it'd be different. There, finally, oh, see, look at that. She has to scurry across. Morning. So bad design leads to that type of behavior. You have to wait until some dear motorist says, oh yes, a uh, little pleb pedestrian, you can cross the road, I'll, I'll stop. But then that only takes care of the one lane. Once again, it's a double lane. She was only looking left, was not looking right. And why? The design. Again, if that was a raised crossing, it probably would have called her attention to look around more. So my chiropractor's right over there. And that's that. That's it. That's the ride. This has been a long video. <laughs> um, and I'm sorry about that, but I just wanted to show off more of what's real. So let's get away from the puff pieces. Let's get away from the shiny stuff, right? And let's focus on what does it really look like to ride a bike in a North American city that's trying and doing a decent job, but still falling short in a lot of places by not completing a network, not implementing the right design and keeping up the status quo of who they prioritize, right? I mean, what do we got here? One, two, three, four, five lanes for cars, plus a sixth for car parking. Well, what, what's the street parking for? Over there, we got surface lots everywhere. Why do we have street parking here that we have to pay for and maintain and creates a longer distance for little Timmy to cross the road and other things like that. Enough, okay, I've ranted. Thanks for sticking around. I hope you got some really useful information out of this. 
that you can um, use in your city. Uh, Our world is so loud because of cars. We have no peace. Um, I hope you can use this in your city, in your design, talking to your leaders, city leaders. And if you are, if you live here in Carmel or in the region and want to come move in here, or uh, I'll just use this infrastructure on a daily basis, take things like this and show them off more, the usual non-shiny things, um, because at least speaking for this city that I live in, they get way too much praise for, again, the pretty things. But they don't get enough scrutiny and pushback about this, right? This needs to be better. So Carmel, you need to do better, and any town USA, you need to do better. The century of car dominance is coming to an end and we need to start to prioritize people and if you want to be fiscally responsible in your city the only way to do that is with non-car infrastructure public transit biking walking density not wide lanes for oversized overpowered vehicles so that somebody has to drive an SUV to get one bag of groceries thanks for sticking around and I'll see you next time. Wish me luck on my ride home. <laughs>